My name is Samantha Ravitch, and I have a confession. I am not a big fan of the information revolution. I know I'm supposed to be. I've been told that more data will lead to more choices and better decisions, which will ultimately lead to happier, more prosperous lives. And we certainly have more information. I mean, you and your colleagues have learned to tag, track, and locate nearly everything. And all that information is addictive to people like me, national security strategic decision makers, especially those of us who have a bent towards the quantitative, because we just know in our bones that the answer, the answer is somewhere in that pile of data. And so we in the U.S. government have tasked our best collectors to work with our best scientists to gather every scrap of information. And I can tell you that as former deputy to、uh, Vice President Cheney and now working with our intelligence community, I have seen amazing technologies. Just thinking about the range of sensors we have, I mean, you know, we can put a sensor on a dog, right? Literally puts the world of information at our fingertips. And so it is not that I'm unappreciative of these seemingly miraculous inventions and innovations that help us in our mission. Because if it is true that data is the new currency, then we must be very, very rich. But sometimes I think we're rich like King Midas. And I'm sure that most of you remember about King Midas.、Um, he was given the golden touch by the gods and initially thrilled with his gift. He soon came to know what it means to have too much of a good thing. Food and wine turned to gold at his touch, and, and he actually wound up killing his daughter when he went to go hug her. So he begged the gods to take away this gift, and they told him to bathe in the river, and he did, and the golden touch flowed downstream to Lydia. And what, what was interesting, Lydia became the richest empire in the world.、Um, Lydia is also thought to have produced the, first, the world's first coinage. So, in today's parlance, we would say that they monetized the gift given to Midas. So, what is it about this myth that reminds me of today? Well, you know, the quest for perfect information has always enticed all decision makers, and the information age seemed to fulfill that quest. I want to spend the next few minutes recalling for you a decision I was involved with、um, during my time in the White House. And、uh, as a way to provide some information,、uh, some insight on how having too much information、uh, may prevent strategic decision makers from reaching their intended goals. Because the question we must all answer is are we to be Lydia, the beneficiary of what was created, or Midas, cursed by seemingly gaining the means to his goal but denied the ability to reach it? I then want to propose a way forward、um, to actually get rich. Well, probably, hopefully, literally get rich for you, unfortunately, probably figuratively get rich for me、um, from that golden touch. But first, I want to just say a few words about fast and slow thinking. The Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman,、um, recently wrote a book、uh, where he explores how experts actually make a lot of right decisions based on what is sometimes called intuition and what Kahneman calls fast thinking. Now, this fast thinking is when the mind brings together all of the knowledge and experience、uh, to quickly integrate information th- and sort through possible choices. You know, it's how a physician can make a complex diagnosis when he only has a single glance at a patient.、Um, and you need this fast thinking to cut down options and do the harder, slow thinking. Right? So, that doctor I mentioned, if I went to him with an eye problem, he would throw out the di- diagnosis of Guatemalan river blindness. Why? Well, I've never been to Guatemala. But I think strategic decision makers are in real danger of the information revolution swamping our ability to do fast thinking, right? And that's the very attribute that we need to do to make the hard policy choices. All right, so I want you to picture this. It's、uh, 2006, and、um, I'm in the Situation Room in the West Wing. 
The war in Afghanistan has been raging for over a half a decade at that point. Um, the White House has received the latest satellite imagery on hectares in Afghanistan under poppy cultivation. We in the Situation Room were shown satellite imagery of Afghan poppy in 2005 and 2006. And 2006 had a lot more red, and red was bad. Right? It was unacceptable to the president that despite our boots on the ground and our birds in the sky and the world's most formidable economy backing this effort, that Afghanistan had become the producer of 93% of the world's illicit opium. So the decision before us in the Situation Room was how to reduce the amount of poppy grown in Afghanistan. What I want you to keep in mind is the tremendous amount of information that floods into that room. We got chart after chart, data set after data set, aerial photo followed by video imagery followed by the best signal intelligence. We were told that exactly 172,600 hectares of poppy was being grown in Afghanistan in 2006. We even knew that 509,000 Afghan families were cultivating poppy. All right, so I may be exaggerating a little bit to say it felt like we could count every single poppy in Afghanistan, but it felt like it. You know, and of course, beyond the poppy count, we got lots of other information. All the structures, the houses, the hospitals, how many guns in circulation, how many houses had media connections, who used what, where, when. It is phenomenal. We were now supposed to think through all of that data, make sense of all of that data, and decide on a pathway forward. And some of the options laid out for us that day included judicial reform, public awareness campaign, agricultural development assistance, drug interdiction, and eradication. Proponents for each of those options gave thoughtful presentations backed by scads of data. All right, again, I want to put you in that room. The best information the world had ever known was being shown to us. But I want you to think about something else as well. People around that table in that situation room were stressed and tired. All right, those of us sitting there, me included, probably had been at that table for two hours before that meeting, and we would be at that table for two, four, six hours afterwards. Why? Well, maybe there was a meeting on the North Korean nuclear program, followed by a meeting on Taiwan elections, followed by an afternoon of counterproliferation and counterterrorism and international trade treaties. Strategic decision makers like those in that room were at serious risk for information overload. Herbert Simon coined the phrase, and he developed an inverted U curve. Right? where the actual amount of information integrated into the decision begins to decline. And more importantly, he recognized that decision makers experience information overload when presented with an overwhelmingly complex decision, even when only a few options are available, because of the many details or attributes of each option that need to be considered. And you know what? When information overload happens, Stressed and tired policymakers either satisfy or opt out. We knew the goal we wanted to achieve, less poppy. We were presented with a number of options, and we had all that amazing information. But what we didn't have were the tools to help us prioritize the information, to help us meet a stated goal. Right? We had no way of using that data to augment our fast thinking. Right, that part of our brain that was trying to call on years of experience in this and similar inst in instances and help us direct us down the right road, then we could employ more slow, deliberative efforts to hone a policy choice. We needed a way to rack and stack the importance of each bit of information to see how it aligned with our goal. But no help was at hand. The tools did not let us answer what is the relative importance of one piece of information versus another. 
is it better to pay farmers not to farm opi uh, poppy or to send their daughters to school so they could get an education and eventually enter society to help the licit economy grow? How many resources should we put into one possibility, one option versus another? This was not a problem of information gathering or even information sharing, right? It wasn't even a problem of information integration. It was that we had few tools to make sense of so much data in a way that we, as decision makers, could comprehend. All right, I also want to get something very clear. These are hard decisions and may not have a right answer. And those who sit in the situation room have accepted the responsibility to make the hard decisions. So no one is seriously looking for a black box. We do not want to take the human and the human mind out of the decision. But frankly, with the overload of information and no new tools to help make sense of it, we're backing into that reality. All right, but back to that room and that clear satellite imagery of 2005 versus 2006 with all that red. And you know what? The option of eradication seemed, to, seemed like the round peg for the round hole. It could get us less red quickly. And even more satisfying, we would be, easy, we would be able to easily measure the result. Right? Eradication is certainly easier than measuring judicial reform or public awareness campaigns. And we did move down that path of eradication along with some complementary efforts. And you know what? It didn't really work. Because the more farms that were burned or poisoned, the more that farmers turned to the easiest option to get out of their debt, which was growing poppy. Violent resistance by farmers increased, as did support for the Taliban in those areas. Ultimately, this was not a failure of information. It was a wrong choice made by decision makers that stemmed in large part by the inability of good, hardworking, dedicated policymakers to synthesize and prioritize the large volumes of data we were given to fulfill the mission. No one wants to take collection and analytics out of the picture. That's absurd. Right? What I hope will be created, however, are the tools that help augment decision makers' fast thinking, not swamp it. The medical profession is getting this assistance. The first medical algorithms, as you may know, were clumsy. They were written in isolation from practitioners. They were unable to discard the irrelevant information. So Guatemalan river blindness would have been left in as a possible diagnosis. And you know what happened? The doctors refused to use it. But then some smart developers, maybe some in this room, realized that they had to understand how doctors do their fast thinking. They studied how doctors make decisions, how doctors choose which data to discard, and the algorithms got better. And the same process, of course, is working on the battlefield because the best tools are built when the, there is a close pairing between the soldier and the developer. All right, so here is where I beg and plead. If doctors and warfighters can get your attention to build the tools that help them, so should we, the strategic decision-making community. Because our need, the country's need, is growing at the rate of the digital universe. If strategic decision-makers in the situation room are going to win the information revolution, Developers need a better insight into the thought process of how the policy decision makers reason and think, how we assemble and prioritize information. Because the more programmers and developers work with decision makers, the better the expert decision making tools that we will create, that you will create, will be. And so just as you consulted with actual doctors and actual warfighters to help build usable tools, Consult with strategic decision makers. Find out how we think, how we reason, how we make decisions. Don't, don't create an isolation and create a whole new set of tools for us. All that data is out there, like gold dust floating down the river. Together, you as the scientists and the engineers and the developers, and we as the policy makers and decision makers can figure out how to be like Lydia of old turning all that gold dust into the coin of the realm. Thank you.